So I'm very excited for this, new, the, this next session. I, I really love to play with IoT stuff, and time series is so important in, in that area. So I'm really looking forward to this, uh, this, this next talk. So let's welcome to the stage Jigar Gudasara for this presentation. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jigar Gudasara. I'm uh, one of the solution architect here at MongoDB. Been with MongoDB now close to five years. And before that, I have spent almost 14 years in uh, different database technologies uh, before MongoDB as well, right? So before I start, uh, we work with uh, devices every day. So whether it's your phone, a Fitbit, uh, it's your smart uh, uh, s home systems and everything. There's a lot of like time-based data around us. So today we're gonna talk about how do we take the time series data and what MongoDB has done in the last couple of years to optimize how developers interact with MongoDB, like make it easier for developers to work with time series data in MongoDB, make it more cost, uh, cost efficient as well. And overall, like uh, the technology overview of uh, best practices on storing time series data within MongoDB. So let's let's settle on what's the time series data. Time series data is pretty much a sequence of measurements that comes at a fixed interval or regular interval from a specific uh, say device, like a sensor or any sort of a smart devices like IoT devices. It could be anything, right? So any devices. And uh, it has a metadata, which is basically pretty much this device IDs. So we, we can group all these measurements per the device ID, right? So that's pretty much what defines the time series data. Right? <clears throat> so what are some of the use cases? Uh, IoT is the most common use case when it comes to the time series data. We're collecting the sensors data or uh, any of smart thermometers, your watch, Fitbit, and everything at regular interval. Then there's a fleet monitoring, a lot of uh, industrial uh, machineries, vehicles, uh, instruments, they all generate this time series data now for predictive maintenance and making sure the machine is healthy and, and whatnot. And then finally we have the financial industry where you have a stock tickers, cryptocurrency prices, they also come in the regular interval and, and those are all the different uh, time series use cases that uh, currently exist. And this is the industry where it's getting more popular as we introduce more and more smart IoT devices. Uh, and we have a lot of customers that are using MongoDB uh, to store the time series data. <clears throat> so our goal at MongoDB has always been making a developer's life easier to work with the data. So with the time series capabilities that were introduced in 5.0, uh, we wanted to make sure that we make it uh, easier and faster and less expensive for the developers to uh, store time series and process time series data within MongoDB, right? Um, with the 5.0, we introduced like what we call like a native support of a time series in MongoDB, and we will deep dive into what that means when we say we can store uh, time series data natively within MongoDB. So we introduced uh, what we call a new type of collection, which is a time series collection. So within MongoDB, if you've been using MongoDB, MongoDB collections has always been just a collection and you can store any document into it, right? With the time series, it's a special type of collection uh, which organizes the data such a way that we are kind of bucketing the data by the devices, like a metadata, and that allows us to organize and group the data more efficiently on the disk. It also optimizes how you create indexes and it also optimizes how it uh, consumes the memory as well. So overall, uh, it's a more seamless, for developers to interact time series data with the optimal data model within MongoDB. So we, we, we introduced that by having a special collection called like a time series collection, uh, which allows, which automatically does this for you behind the scene. And we will go through some of the examples of what this looks like, right? <clears throat> so let's talk about some of the benefits of why we invested our engineering effort into introducing the native capabilities of time series in MongoDB. Utmost is the developer productivity. Before we introduce the time series capabilities, we have customers using MongoDB for time series data. And the way they had to implement that was they had to implement the best practices in the data model. So they had to create the arrays of measurements and have to interact with MongoDB uh, in that fashion. So there's a little bit of overhead on the developer side to develop those applications 
to having the data model in mind, right? Uh, you can make mistakes uh, on the data model or you have to have advanced query language you have to write your own and everything. So we take away all that complexity and make it easier for, to, for you to interact with MongoDB in a time series. So that's reduced complexity, kind of obviously improves the developer productivity. And at the same time, you also wanted to make sure that we are uh, applying the optimal data model so we are packing this measurement into a single document so that's reduced the number of IOPS it consumes significantly. So if you are able to compact 100 measurements into a one array, then you're reducing the 100 IOPS to one IOP, right? At the same time, we are using a new technology like a Columnar Data Store as well underneath. So the Columnar Store is not openly available to Mong like MongoDB customers yet. But from time series perspective, we are leveraging that our newer development we have to make sure that we are optimally storing this data at the, at the physical layer, right? And finally, we are optimizing how we consume wire tiger cache. So time series data remains compressed in the wire tiger cache, and it, it uses the memory more efficiently uh, when, to serve the reads more performant, right? So any read queries against the time series collection, it is more optimized now using a time series collection. Right? So what does a collection look like? So when you define the time series collection, uh, you will have to run this create collection command. Uh, so in this example, we're cre creating a weather collection. The only mandatory field is the time field. Because of the time series collection, you have to define which field is gonna represent the timestamp that the time series is based on. The other fields you, will, uh, you probably wanna specify as a meta field. So meta field is uh, sort of like a device ID or the metadata that you're gonna collect the measurement on. So in the, in the sensors use case, that would be the sensor ID. In the vehicles, it could be the vehicle ID. So that's the metadata, right? And the granularity, we'll deep dive into the, what that means, but it basically defines approximately how frequently the, this measurement's coming in. So there are seconds, minutes, and hours, different options for that. And then we also have a TTL, uh, how long does it take before it expires as well? So we kind of added that, meaning that you can expire this data after 600, uh, 9,000 seconds in this example, or whatever, however long you wanna leave your data, right? So this is the new time series collections. Uh, that's the heart of the, this new feature. Uh, so you have to uh, think about how you wanna design this. If you can have, you can use a multiple document, uh, like a sub documents for meta field. So you could have multiple fields that can represent the meta, the metadata, uh, and then everything else that goes into these documents will become the, the measurement. So you could have multiple measurements. So for weather data, you could be uh, the weather, the wind speed, the humidity in the air. You can collect multiple readings uh, for each devices as well. So let's talk about some of the concepts I, may, I mentioned in the uh, slide, some meta field. Meta field is, uh, in this example, I have the weather data. Uh, oops, uh, misclick there. Yeah, so the meta field is basically uh, when you have incoming documents in the time series, uh, the, the field that defines uh, the, the measurements is based on. So sensor ID, vehicle ID, uh, and all that, right? Um, meta field is critical in the sense that that defines the cardinality of your uh, uh, time series data, and the cardinality will uh, dictates how many uh, buckets you're gonna have in the time series collection as well, because each metadata will create its own bucket, right? So because uh, we are optimizing the data that we are storing for grouping these me measurements for a single entity, and that entity is basically the metadata, right? So in this example, uh, we have three different, uh, two different sensors, sensor ID one, two, three, and four, five, six, uh, and seven, eight, nine. All three are three different series, time series, and they each represents uh, sort of metadata for that time series collection. The next is measurements. So measurements is the measurements we are reading on that metadata field that we just defined. So for weather data, we are just collecting a temperature here, but it could be uh, anything, so for vehicles, it could be speed, the temperature of the engine. Um, there's a there's a hundred different matrix you could collect from the uh, from the vehicles, especially the smart vehicles these days. So all those becomes uh, sort of uh, uh, the measurements that we collect, 
right? So measurements are simply a key value pairs most of the time. So it defines which measurement we are reading and the actual amount of the measurement. Uh, so if it's temperature, then the uh, temperature, you can have another field like here which says Celsius or uh, like a unit, uh, Fahrenheit or Celsius, or you can, you can have a, 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 as many measurements as you like. Right? So let's focus on the granularity now. So the granularity defines uh, approximately how often the data is coming in. And that help us to sort of uh, define how we're gonna physically bucket the, the, the group, that data together. So there are three possible uh, settings for that. One is seconds. So seconds allows up to like 60 seconds of data, uh, sorry, one hour uh, between one to, uh, up to one hours of data will be grouped together. Uh, the next one is the minutes. So minutes is that every, the data is coming like approximately every minute interval from the each sensor. Uh, so that will allow you to store up to like uh, 24 hours of data. And then finally we have hours, so meaning the data is coming less frequently and uh, we can group it all the way up to like 30 days uh, with that, right? So this uh, granularity kind of uh, helps to optimize how we are bucketing and grouping the data. And uh, if by default, if you don't know, we just use seconds. Uh, but if you know and if you can classify this, that will actually help you to optimize the size of the each buckets and which eventually can optimize the IO and the memory consumption as well. Expired after second, uh, if you're used to MongoDB's uh, time to live indexes, it pretty much defines that after this many seconds, delete this record simply, right? So uh, it allows you to clean up your collections uh, because a lot of the IoT data is only useful for a certain period of time, like last 30 days or last one week. Uh, this settings will allow you to automatically delete the data after that time period, right? So if you want to keep it uh, sort of a uh, uh, sort of a like capped collection, similar to the, in that fashion, uh, you don't want to have the data after a certain uh, uh, amount of days. Then you can apply the settings, and it, it will efficiently uh, delete those records from the database. So how do you work with the time series data? So let's walk through some examples. So when the data is coming in, the time series data, this is typically what it looks like. So you got individual documents. So when you're inserting from the, from the developer perspective, you're inserting all this reading just like a simple document. So you have sensor ID 789 with the temperature 97, 456 and so on, right? So that from a developer perspective, it doesn't look anything different. It's the same documents, JSON based documents. You are just using the insert many to insert the multiple uh, documents in the collection. And then when you are uh, retrieving the data back from MongoDB, you're just gonna say run find with a, maybe some uh, filters here as well. But when you return, when you run that find, you're gonna get back all your readings as well. So there's nothing new in terms of how you interact with MongoDB, right? So what's the point of having a time series data? So behind the scene, what we are doing is we are applying this data model strategy called bucketing. So this is one of the patterns we have for data modeling is called bucketing. If you look at the MongoDB University and some of our documents and literatures on architecture patterns, one of the patterns is the bucketing. So bucketing is pretty much we are grouping a bunch of readings into an array and storing into a single document. And the reason we are doing that is to optimize the storage, optimize the amount of I.O. when you read those documents back. And also it allows us to uh, sort of reduce the index size as well, right? So we are applying the, we are, we are, so whenever you insert, when you run that insert many, we are transforming that insert into sort of a bucketing uh, array behind the scene. So we have, what we call uh, actual time series collection, which is physically a different representation of your data. And we apply the data model and we do conversion that automatically behind the scene. So as a developer, you don't have to have this overhead of inserting your data into arrays and maintaining the arrays yourself, right? We do that for you. And that's the benefit of time series collection, right? We take care of all that uh, overhead and burden from the developers to MongoDB engine. Right? Now, <coughs> When you, when you have this time series collection, 
uh, all the data remains compressed, not only on the disk, and we apply the columnar compression, and it has a much more compression, like almost up to like 30 times compression, uh, uh, compared to traditional compression, which is only like two to three times, right? And we also have uh, amount of RAM set aside in memory, like uh, by default is like 2.5% of the total RAM for the open buckets. So what we do is uh, in, in, we kind of keep track of these open buckets in memory. So each bucket represents uh, the, uh, one metadata field, meaning that one sensor. So the number of devices you have, you're gonna have that many number of open buckets in the MongoDB engine, and that's all gonna be in memory to make sure that the bucket is, uh, is, remains open and we can have a maximum size bucket as much as possible before we uh, close that bucket, right? <coughs> so now let's take a look at example of uh, this insert menu here where we have uh, multiple sensors inserting the temperature. So what the bucketing looks like is we're gonna take each sensor ID and create its own document. So this one green box is a one big document. And within that we have a two fields, one is a timestamp, one is a temperature. And those are a list of an array. Meaning that we, uh, this is what this bucket looks like from a physical representation. So we're gonna take all the readings that's coming from sensor 789 so the first one and the third one, and we're gonna put it together in, a, in one array uh, of uh, timestamp and the, uh, and the temperature, the two different fields, right? Same thing with the sensor, like four, five, and six. So essentially we have like a two different buckets. Now, when you, when you look at the, uh, the, the definition of the time series collections that we had created, uh, the metadata will map to that sensor ID on the top, right? And all these fields are the measurements, and that's the time field that we, we define in the, the time series collection, right? The measurement, so if you have more than one measurement, then you will have more than one arrays uh, for each measurement within the same bucket as well. So you could have like temperature, you could have a wind speed, and you can have the humidity, and you can have other uh, uh, values, then they all will be part of uh, other like array elements here as well, right? Now when you, when you do the command line and when you actually insert that, and if you look at the time series collection by describing the collection, you can see here that there is a, the one big document is a one bucket. The metadata is right here in the middle where it represents by the meta and four, five, six. Now, and then these are all the data elements. So there's a temperature and that's a, uh, that's a timestamp, right? Now, and we also preserve the original object ID from the incoming documents. Now up here, what we have is sort of like a cube representation or the summary of that bucket. So we store the mean and max values for each measurement. So we have a mean and max for timestamp and mean and max for the temperature value as well, right? And this is what we leverage when we're scanning the data to optimize our reads. So when you say give me my temperatures, uh, between say 70 degrees and 75 degrees, then we will leverage mean and max values to only look at the buckets uh, which has those ranges, right? So it kind of optimizes the reads. And because we are storing all this data together in the same document, it kind of, op uh, it kind of compresses better and it kind of uh, stores to reduce the number of IOs uh, because we, are, we have smaller number of documents now. So we talked about granularity. So when we, and the, the reason this is important is that when you have granularity defines as seconds, we can store up to like one hour worth of data or there's a certain, um, like we, we, we don't exist more than uh, I believe a thousand read, readings and there's a certain size of bucket, we won't exceed that so we will create a new bucket. But if you don't exceed those other limits then we allow, we store like a one hour for seconds granularity uh, and also one day for minutes and, and uh, 30 days for when we have hours, right? So it basically defines the, 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 the time for the, for the span where one metadata can store into one bucket, pretty much, right? So what does it look like in the, in the physical representation? So let's take an example of, uh, say, census 789, right? Uh, or metadata 456. So, the first reading that came at 9.05. So that 9.05, when we look at the, the mean and max, 
the minimum time stamp we're going to sort of uh, roll down to like 9 o'clock so that all the readings that's coming in and they're out of sequence. So there might be a reading coming at 9.04, but it came after 9.05 for what network latency or whatever reason, right? Then because we have a minimum of 9 o'clock, that will, uh, that will, we will, we will be able to take that in and put it in the same bucket. Meaning that uh, we're gonna roll up to the hour and make sure that we are able to take the mean and max value such a way that we, we can store all the readings that's coming in one hour and they might be slightly in a different order. Right? I hope that makes sense, what I'm explaining. But essentially, that granularity will allow you to configure your bucket such a way that it's able to adjust those uh, certain variations and uh, the, it's not, all the devices may not be submitting readings in the same order because of the network latency and other, other issues that they may have. Right? <clears throat> so when you work with the time series data, one thing we mentioned was that it also reduces your size of indexes, right? So how do we do that? So when you create your buckets, we are essentially creating, I'm not sure why it's doing that, but we are indexing the, all the indexes at the bucket level. Is this me or? So we are creating indexes at the bucket level instead of individual documents, and that's what optimizes the index. Uh, there is a, oh. <clears throat> so reduction in the index size is depending on your bucket size. So if you're able to fit 100 readings in your bucket, you're basically reducing your index size by 100 times, which is a significant improvement, right? Now, if you're familiar with MongoDB's best practices when it comes to the performance, uh, the working data set side, we need to be able to fit in the memory for opt most optimal performance, right? So reducing the index size will help you to probably save more data into your, your RAM, right? Because uh, index is part of your working data set size, right? <coughs> okay, now it's gone. Okay, it's back. So you can also create your own indexes, secondary indexes on time series collections, and there's a couple of examples I'll give you. But there's also one index that's hidden and it's always created, is what we call a clustered index. So for every bucket, because we all have a timestamp, we're gonna have a system generated like a, a bucket, which are a cluster index, which, which is based on the timestamp on the each bucket. And that will allow us to put all these buckets together adjacent to each other. So when you're doing a time-based scan or sort, it automatically leverages that cluster index to improve your query performance by default. So if you, if you take a look at an example here, um, <clears throat> based on the timestamp, which is in the minimum timestamp, that's just what we use to create the object ID and there's a uh, unique index on underscore ID here as well, right? So this is a hidden sort of a, you don't need to know about this uh, anyways, it's already there. So if you have any queries that are coming in which is based on the, this timestamp, then it will automatically use this cluster index to optimize the IO and the, and the sort and query performance and everything, right? But you can create your own indexes. So we highly recommend that you look at your query pattern and start, uh, you also deploy these indexes on the time series collection. So in this example, you are searching for, uh, you, you may have a query pattern which says, give me the readings for all the sensor IDs. Uh, so for that, you, need a, you wanna create an index on the sensor ID. So when you create that index, what we are doing behind the scene is that, now the metadata, the sensor ID is a metadata field. So we're gonna create index on the meta field here, but this is at the bucket level, meaning that we, not, we don't have to create index now for every readings, right? So it's an optimized index for the sensor ID. The, another example is we wanna create the index on a sensor ID, but our query in our query, we also wanna say that give me for this sensor between this time range or, or, less, or greater than like last 24 hours, it could be any query based on the timestamp as well. Then for that, we wanna create a compound index, which is on the sensor ID, which is your metadata and also the timestamp as well. But we create the timestamp, 
uh, for the timestamp field, we're going to use the mean and max timestamp. We are not going to create the index on this actual timestamp values in the bucket, in the array. Because this mean and max will allow you to, will allow us to do the range-based queries easily without creating a multiple indexes for multiple readings that we are storing in the bucket, right? <clears throat> So this is, the, this is the main difference here in optimization we're doing at the in, for the in compound indexes where we are, all the indexes we're creating is at the bucket level, meaning that for one bucket, we only need a one index entry. If you were to create index at the, this level, like for every reading, then if you have 100 readings, we will have 100 different index entries, right? So optimizing this and creating the compound index at the bucket level sort of help us to reduce the resources and optimize the memory consumption and everything, okay? That eventually reduce the, your uh, Atlas cluster size and eventually helps you to save money. <clears throat> now, if you have a index on the measurements, so that's something new we introduced in version six. So when you create the indexes on the measurements, meaning that you wanna have a query something like, give me all the sensors which are, has a abnormal temperature like more than 100 degrees, uh, or it could be any, any query, then you can get index on the measurements like a temperature. And again, in that case, we have the summary of the temperature up here on the top. So there's a mean and max value for the temperature. And we will use those values to create the index and not the individual readings down here. So when you, so how does the query processing work? Because uh, we are changing the, all the incoming readings which comes as a simple document like mini documents and when you're putting into an array. What we have done is that we also changed how we run our query against time series collection. So when you run just simple find against the time series collection, behind the scene, we are doing a query rewrite so that we can process the arrays uh, because to process the arrays, we need to unwind the array and, and, and then process the each reading to find the right results based on the query, right? That all happens automatically as part of the MongoDB query engine, right? It sounds a bit more work, but actually uh, it's more efficient when you're reading the large amount of readings off of the disk because this kind of optimizes the, uh, the cache and it, opti it only touches the buckets that you need based on the query predicates and everything. Nobody's gonna run, uh, you should not, you should never run this fine without any uh, predicates anyways, because that's the collection scan pretty much. So when the, with the IoT, you may have a lot of data, so you don't wanna run collection scan with the IoT. So what's happening is, when you're running this query with the fine sensor ID 456, we are, is, we are kind of uh, unpacking, so this is the physical representation of the data, and then we're gonna take that, we're gonna unpack these arrays, and we're gonna, uh, create the output which looks like the original input. So if this document's kind of, this reading's kind of matched uh, the output, then we're gonna generate that uh, output which, which looks like exactly same as the original documents that's coming back. So as a user, when you get the data back, you're just getting individual documents for individual readings. You're not gonna see the array, right? So the, the whole explanation I just went through around the physical representation of that time series collection, that's completely hidden from the developers. You don't really need to know anything about that. But if you know it, you can design it better, you can define your metadata better, you can define your granularity better, and it kind of helps you to understand how it works behind the scene, right? You can do exactly the same thing before uh, hand as well, like developers used to do that manually before time series collections were in, uh, introduced. So you can, uh, <coughs> now you don't have to do it manually. All right, this is another example of sensor ID timestamp. Again, we're just gonna unpack and just process that. <clears throat> so what are some of the best practices? Um, if you have retravel writes, disable that because that's gonna improve your throughput. Uh, when you're doing the batch writes, make sure that you're grouping your writes by the uh, metadata object, so your sensor ID. Choose the metadata that never changes. <clears throat> we do allow updates on that, but uh, the less they change, the less changes in the physical bucket design. Make sure you have enough RAM allocated so that there is a enough number of uh, open buckets uh, available so that uh, you can handle all the, the metadata uh, or different sensor IDs. 
Uh, you can increase your uh, number of cardinality and sensors by sharding. So we allow horizontal scaling of the time series collection as well. And don't forget to create your secondary indexes for optimal performance. <clears throat> so this is the roadmap. We do release 6.0 as a GA now, which has all the benefits of uh, everything we have introduced slowly starting from 5.0 to 6.0, so it's like for one year of timestamp. Uh, we have this new query operators, top end, bottom end, accumulators, uh, and we also feel we have operators to fill the gaps if you have a gaps in your readings in the time series selection. Uh, so support for sharding was introduced in 506. Uh, we do use columnar compression, which gives you uh, some fantastic results when it comes to compression. And we do store time series collection in memory compressed as well. So this one you can see there's almost like 30 times compression, like almost 97% reduction in the data set size. <clears throat> multi delete support that was introduced later as well, where you can delete multiple um, uh, meta fields as well. So you can do now delete the data from the time series collection that was restricted from the uh, initial deployment. And uh, we also introduced now indexes for the measurements as well. So you can now run queries based on the specific range of values for measurements. Yeah. So with that, I think I have time for questions because I know I'm running short on time. <laughs> if you have any questions, you can find me. I'm local here in Toronto. So if they don't let me ask questions, <laughs> I'm available for questions after that. Perfect. You'll be in the Expo Hall for I'll the next be outside couple of minutes. For, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for this session. What I like the most about Time Series is how there's so much going on behind the scenes, but uh, for developers, it's exactly the same API and it's exactly Correct. the same thing as usual. So Correct. That's great. Don't forget to raise the session, and our next session will be at 10 minutes, I believe. Perfect. Thank you.